today uh, I'm going to talk to you guys. Well, we're going to continue through Philippians. Uh, uh, however, I'm going to give you a little uh, background and a recap of last week before we tie into the rest of uh, chapter 1 because it's important and it's very important that we understand uh, exactly what Paul's trying to tell us in these verses. So uh, prior to doing that, I'm going to uh, pray and ask Lord to ask the Lord to uh, uh, help us to just grasp everything he has for us today. And so uh, let's pray. Uh, Lord God, uh, uh, as your word goes out today, Lord, may it all be you, Lord, from your spirit. Nothing from me, Lord, but that you can touch lives and hearts in this room and uh, uh, with the word that you would have them to receive, Lord. I pray that uh, you would do it, Lord. Use me as your vessel this morning. And uh, uh, Lord, again, it's just such a privilege to be able to uh, worship in your house and to hear your word, Lord. And uh, Lord, we just thank you so much. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right. Uh, you can get your Bibles out and turn to, uh, well, let me give you a little uh, preface first. Uh, on, uh, I went to Acts uh, 16. I have to get my glasses on to see my notes. Even though I've made an elephant font, I still have to look. I was, I was meeting last week with my younger brother in Salado, Texas. We were going over some things and... and uh, he was looking at me while I was looking at his laptop, and he goes, man, dude, you need some carrots. Those reading glasses are thick. You need to start eating carrots, man. We pick at each other all the time. You know, it's just good fun, but hey, you know, I never thought I'd live to be this old either. All right, Acts 16, uh, in verses uh, 6 through 12, it gives us a background specifically on how Paul ended up in Philippi to begin with. Uh, the Philippians uh, had received the word from Paul 10 years ago, and now Paul's sitting in a prison. And uh, I thought, well, what exactly happened when Paul shared the gospel with the Philippians? Uh, so I started thinking about that, and I thought, well, let's see how that happened. How did he end up in Philippi anyway? He made three missionary journeys, and, and, and this one particular journey uh, he was uh, uh, diverted, if you will. Uh, God, Holy Spirit said, don't go there, go there. Don't. And then that happened a couple of times. Don't go there, go there. And I'm thinking, okay, so how was it that the Philippians received uh, the gospel? Was it by Paul? No, it was not by Paul. Paul brought the gospel to the Philippians, but God brought it there. God's Holy Spirit, because... God kept redirecting Paul until he ended up in Philippi. So who, who wanted those Philippians to be saved, born-again believers? God did, just like he wants that for all of us. And so I, I wanted to read that to you just to give you a good background on, on what we're talking about. In verse 6, in chapter 16, it says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden get that forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia so that's the first turning point point. and when they had come to Mycenae they attempted to go to Bithynia but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them that's the second turning point so passing by Messiah they went down to Troas and a vision appeared to Paul in the night a man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying Come over to Macedonia and, Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia, and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. When he said we, he's talking about Paul, Timothy, and Silas. They were traveling together on this particular journey. So they stayed there for a while with these Philippians and shared the gospel with them and met in the temple and, and 
uh, all these believers were uh, they were born again in this area and now the, the passages of scripture we're going to study this morning this is 10 years later and they have a thriving believer community in philippi why because god brought them the gospel god did that paul was just what the messenger what are we when we share the gospel we're just vessels we are messengers we we can't if if we share the gospel with somebody and they they're born again or whatever what can we claim nothing because all of these instances of circumstance are orchestrated by the holy spirit don't miss that those are orchestrated by the holy spirit it's not an accident anytime you're out there sharing the gospel with somebody there is there's no accident to that at all god is orchestrating that okay so don't forget that that's very important in in your own growth and in your faith okay so let's stand and we'll read through the passages of scripture this morning and dissect this stuff a little bit all right philippians chapter 1 verse 19 to 30 it says yes and i will rejoice for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I see, which, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is, far, is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that when I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. You may be seated. Okay, there's a lot of stuff here. Uh, Paul is... Uh, trying to get across to not only uh, the Philippians, but to uh, you and I as well. Uh, the Bible is timeless. We have, uh, I don't know what, 2,000 years since this was written. Uh, but it's still as applicable today as it was back then. So verse 19, yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the whole, uh, the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. So Paul is confident. He says, "I know that this is going to turn out for my deliverance. In the end, I'm going to be delivered." Is what he's saying. He says, "I know that that's going to happen." Why? He gives you two reasons. He says, "Through your prayers, okay, the prayers of the Philippians." and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He gives two reasons why he thinks this is gonna happen. And, he's, and it, it, he's confident of it. He says, I know that this is gonna happen. My deliverance, uh, uh, God will work it out, okay? He's convinced of it. Uh, the Greek word Paul uses for help is epikorygius, epikorygius. And that means, uh, and, and that help, uh, word is uh, when he says with the help of the spirit of Jesus Christ he uses that as one of the reasons why he knows he's going to be delivered but he uses that word and it's interesting that that help word that he's talking about 
is uh, translates to uh, uh, it means to provide support much like a ligament provides support in a physical body so that's if, for the, those of you who are medical in here those ligaments tie tie everything together between your bones and all of that and your muscles and and they help you to be able to walk and move and everything so that's the help that he's talking about that's the word that he he's using and that help is coming from the lord jesus christ so he says i already know that i'm going to be delivered so how is it how nice is it to walk in that kind of confidence you know uh, amen uh so the the real interesting part about this passage though is that uh paul is talking about deliverance but you have to know the character of Paul to know what he's talking about. Deliverance for Paul does not necessarily mean a get out of prison free card. He's not necessarily talking about that. That could be, but the other thing with Paul knowing his character is deliverance from this world. He's dying to go home to be with Jesus. That's his that's his goal. He he wants to be done with all the the whippings and the stonings and the shipwrecks and all of that and just okay lord I, I was your servant but i'm really ready to go i'm ready to vacate this place and so when he says deliverance he's it's a double meaning for him uh, deliverance could be death okay or leaving this world uh, but he's willing to go with god's plan uh, even though he prefers death over life he's willing to go with god's plan okay Paul doesn't fear death. It's something that he embraces. Uh, last week we talked about uh, soldiers. What's the most dangerous soldier in the world? Is the soldier that does not fear death. You can't stop a guy like that. He's not afraid. You know, take your best shot. Kill me. You know, in Paul's case, I'll just go home to be with Jesus. You know, so. Um, Paul is the epitome of a Christian soldier. And he's not afraid to carry the gospel. So look at verse 20. As it, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul's not sure what's going to happen, whether he's going to be released or whether he's going to be killed or, or what. But he's good either way. He wants what God wants. But look at verse 20. What is, what is it that he wants more than anything? He wants full courage. He wants to be able to face whatever it is with full courage and represent the Lord Jesus Christ well. Uh, that's what he really wants, and that's what he's asking for, whether he lives or dies. He says that it is his eager expectation that this happens, meaning that he will have full courage when it comes to that time when he's either checking out or whatever it is God's using him in whatever capacity that he will have full courage in it he wants to be strong in it he wants to leave that legacy okay that he was strong and he carried the gospel right <laughs> he says it's his eager expectation that this happens uh eager expectation the greek word he uses is i'm going to butcher this one apokaradakia apokaradakia which literally it means to strain your neck to catch a glimpse of something that is ahead when you're stretching out and you want something to happen so bad he wants that courage to share the gospel that's his desire that's what he really wants and so he's stretching his neck to catch a glimpse of that which is ahead he desperately wants it and he's hopeful that he will display full courage in honoring Christ so is he afraid of what's going to happen to him no he's courageous and he wants that more than anything he's got a split personality here though because he says well release if they release me i get to share the gospel more and carry uh, and have more fruit on this earth but he says it's okay uh, my martyrdom would advance the gospel as well it would and so he's he's he says i don't know what to do basically he's and so uh, <clears throat> he's kind of at a quandary. So that's where we need to ponder. We need to look at our own lives and examine 
What testimony would be left behind for us when we pass from this earth? What are people going to be saying about you and I when we leave this earth? What are they going to say? What kind of legacy are we going to leave? Paul is pondering that right now. He says, I just want to be courageous when that time comes. Okay. And so what do, what do we think about in our quiet time when we ponder that? What, what do we want people to talk about, to say about you and I after we leave? Have you ever really given that much thought? Uh, are our lives, uh, or what would our legacy be? Our lives being changed and pointed toward Christ because of our existence? Or do we just drift through life, you know? Eh, we don't think past tomorrow and uh, don't worry about anything, you know, as long as we can pay our bills and, and do that thing, you know, we're, we're fine. No, we need to ponder these things. We need to think about what your legacy is uh, when you leave this earth. Are people going to be changed because you lived here on this planet? Are they going to be changed in a positive way for Christ or not? You know, and again, it goes back and I covered this with you guys a lot already just since I start, started preaching. It's up to us. We get to choose. Nobody's tying your hands and saying you just have to go through the motions of life and uh, that's it. And then you die. No, you get to choose. Are you going to be that Christian soldier or not? Are you? We get to choose. Okay. Verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. This is one of the most famous verses in the gospel. I even gave uh, Jason uh, a slide for it because I, I didn't understand the slide. Do you understand the slide? I didn't understand it either. Um, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, Jason said it's because when we die, how do you say it? Death is up, turns upside down. We're going to be with the Lord. So that's why the gravestone is growing from, from the top down. I don't know. I just thought it was pretty cool. Okay. <laughs> All right, so God's main purpose in life is to glorify Christ in life or in death, right? Okay, he wants his life to be a living testimony, uh, even in death. So even though it, it appears that he prefers death, uh, that's, that's uh, a, like I said, a choice that you and I both need to make as well. Are we going to get to that point? Freedom uh, death is freedom to Paul, uh, but he wants God's will more. Whatever God wants, that's what he wants. And I pulled a, a passage of scripture out of Matthew 26, 42. Because you guys know that God grows us to be more like his son Jesus. Okay, that's his, that's his goal. He wants to grow us to be more like his son Jesus. So what did Jesus want when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane? Matthew 26, 42. Again, this is Jesus' words. For the second time, or this is not his words, this is the account. For the second time, he went away and prayed. This is Jesus praying. My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. So Jesus is saying, if there's any way I can avoid the cross, hey, okay, but I want your will, not my will. And that's what Paul is saying here. He says, Lord, I'm, I'm willing to die. I'd be glad to die and go to heaven right now, but not my will. I want your will. If you want me to stay here and minister more to the Philippians and everybody else, that's what I'll do because he wants what God wants, right? Christ is the essence of Paul's life, uh, just like he should be the essence of our lives. We need to get to that place where we say, you know, I'd really like to uh, buy that Corvette and drive to Vegas next week, you know, and, and just, you know, gamble or whatever if that's the, your desire but I want what God wants for me I guarantee you that's not it but but uh, uh, we have to get to that place where what God wants for our life is our what we want for our life does that make sense we have to want what God wants and let me tell you what your prayer life will explode with uh, checking the boxes of everything that God's done 
when your prayers align with what God wants. You know what I'm saying? If you're asking for the new Corvette, mm, probably not going to do anything but bounce off the ceiling your prayer. But if you're asking for what God wants, then I can guarantee you that's, that's going to be a whole different thing. I know my wife is... My wife is smiling back there because we lived through that, learning that. It was a process because when you're a new Christian, you ask for some pretty stupid things. <laughs> you know, and that, that's me and her as well. So, but uh, uh, when, you're, when your wants align with what God wants for you, man, you, it's like a guarantee. You know, your prayers are going to be answered. Verse 22, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. Paul's frustrated. He says, I can't choose. Uh, it's too hard for me to choose. I'm good either way. I just want what Jesus wants for me. Uh, I could go on living and be fruitful uh, uh, for his labor, or I can check out either way. God's going to bless his work either way. Uh, but his, his definite, definite preference is to go to heaven and be with Jesus. I think I've shared that with you before. I, I was raised by my mom, and that's what she always said. You know, she, she did not have an easy life, but she would always say, I just want to go home and be with Jesus. What? You know, but that's the way she was. She... She had that intimate desire to just be with the Lord. And uh, I was a little boy in the 1950s. <laughs> uh, I'd go outside and she'd be hanging clothes on the clothesline, you know, back then. Y'all know what a clothesline is? Yeah, some of you do. And uh, she'd be hanging clothes on the clothesline and she'd be crying. And I'd little boy run up and, what's wrong, Mom? What's wrong? Oh, we can't pay the J.C. Penney's charge card, or we can't do this, and I want to get shoes for your brother, and we don't have the money. And, and I, you know, I'd tell her, it's going to be okay. And she'd say, I just want to go home and be with Jesus. <laughs> okay, but can we have dinner first? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Y'all remember, uh, you know, that was a terrible thing back in the 1950s. That's when charge cards started. There was no plastic before then. And, and uh, man, they, they suckered everybody in. Before that, it was layaway. If you wanted to buy a bicycle for your kid or whatever, you put it in a layaway and you made $5 a month payments or whatever until you could get it out. They wouldn't let you have it until you paid it off. But then here comes charge cards. And, Ooh, instant money, you know. So everybody in the world that I know have gotten trouble with charge cards way back in the 1950s. <laughs> with the 25% interest payment, you know. Wait a minute, we already paid this. No, you just paid the interest. Anyway, I'm getting off track. Uh, so she just wanted to go home and be with Jesus. And, and she finally did. And, uh, but uh, what a wonderful legacy she left. What a wonderful legacy. Uh, verse 23 and 24. I am hard pressed between the two. Paul's saying, I can't choose. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is, uh, is more necessary on your account. So he knew that the Philippians needed him still and wanted him there. So he, like I said, he had, uh, uh, it was a split personality, if you will. He wanted to go and then he wanted to stay, but he mostly wanted what God wanted. He certainly had a selfless attitude. I guarantee you that he cared about other people. Okay. What did Jesus care about people? Yes, exactly. Jesus didn't care about any material possessions. He didn't care about where he lived. He didn't even have a house. Uh, so, he cared about people. Well, Paul is exhibiting those same traits. He cares about the people. He puts other, others ahead of his own needs uh, with a very selfless attitude. How about us? Do we care about other people more than we do about ourselves? Do we? Really? Do we really? You know, I have to ponder that in your own spirit, whether you do or not. Mostly in our world today, people just want to put themselves first. Whatever 
whatever it is there, well, you know, I'm number one. I want to put myself first. Well, that's not uh, the Christian way to live. I had formulated a, uh, uh, a list years ago that is still kind of a, a work in progress, if you will. But I tried to decide where I would fit on that hierarchy of who I put first in my life. Okay. So I came up with number one, which is God. Okay. God's going to be number one in my life. And number two, I'm going to put my spouse at number two and my children at number three. And then all other people will be number four. And then me would be number five. Now your list is going to be different. You know, everybody's list is going to be different, but you should have the basics right. God's needs to be first in your life. Uh, and I've done some tweaking on the list based on a boating accident. You know, say you have a boating accident and the boat's going down and you're a great swimmer, Sean, you can, I mean, you can really go. And so all of your family's in the water and the ship sank. And so who do you save first? Well, there's some variables. It's one, who, who's most in a position to get saved? Who's a closer distance to you? Or you can use Nathan's list, you know, and uh, go, okay, so I need to save my spouse first or whatever, and then the kids. Some of you will have that flipped over. You want to save the kids first. But it gets complicated because you save them by age, you know, if it's the kids. You, you, you know, really, and you have to think about this thing because, you know, you, you may be in that boating accident, you know. Uh, but... Uh, I, I would recommend, though, if you do have a list and you formulated, formulated your list and your spouse is number five on the list, don't share the list with her. Don't, don't share the list with her. You know, that gets awkward. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, uh, that's something that we need to think about. Verse 25 says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Okay. Notice Paul's had to change the heart. Now he's totally convinced that he's staying and not dying. Something happened. I don't know what, but he's convinced that, that God wants him to stay. He, or he appears convinced. He's not going to be killed anytime soon. Uh, I guess the Roman guards that were chained to him, that uh, they decided that... Uh, uh, they can't take it anymore, so they're going to let him go or whatever because he's evangelizing them all. Uh, anyway, uh, he affirms that uh, his release will cause the Philippians to grow in faith and have joy in their spirit. Okay, Joy in the faith. They're going to have that because of his release. Now he's convinced that he'll be released, which he is, but he says... Uh, that they, I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. All right, now, now you're in prison. All of you guys are in prison, let's say. Are there people that are going to have joy in the faith because you're released? You need to think about that. If you're released from prison, is there a group of people that are going to progress in the faith and have joy in the faith because you're released. Okay? Something to think about, isn't it? And if the answer is, well, probably not, then why not? All right? We need to be growing as to where we reach that point where if you were locked up and then suddenly released, that there would be those that would be going, yes, he got out, you know, or she got out. It's very important. Verse 26 and 27. So that in me, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only Verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or, or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Okay, 
Paul had the, uh, the Philippian believers on his heart, didn't he? Uh, whether, no matter what happened, whether he was going to be martyred or what, uh, he wanted them to honor and glorify the Lord. And the word in verse 27, to live in a way that is worthy of the gospel, uh, is, the, is a Greek word that means to behave as citizens that call themselves Christians, okay? There's a certain behavior that, we talked about this before, Christians are a peculiar, peculiar people. The world doesn't understand what makes you tick. Did you know that? The world has no idea because they're not believers. So he's telling the Philippians, he says, I just want you to behave in a way that is becoming of being, naming the name of Christ, okay? I want you to do that. What is that? What is, why is that so important? And I was thinking about that when I was uh, preparing this particular sermon. I said, why is that so important? Why is Paul so concerned that they behave like Christians? Okay, well, what happens to their testimony if they don't behave as Christians and then try to share Christ with somebody? I had a friend I used to work with, and I think I shared this with you. He was a godly Christian man, but he had a terrible work ethic at work terrible well what happens when he tries to share christ with somebody they don't want to know anything about his jesus because i'm i'm serious because he's like you know he's the worst worker we got you know so if you are not behaving uh, in a christian manner uh, morally speaking if you're not conducting yourself as you should how does that affect your testimony well, it, it destroys it, honestly. Uh, if you have no work ethic, if you're, let's say you're a gossiper, a cheater, or you're unscrupulous in your business, uh, nobody wants to hear about your Jesus. I'm sorry. But, and this is, just, this is just a side note from Nathan. If you are calling yourself a Christian, but you are behaving in these ways unscrupulous and gossiper and you're a habitual liar and all that i would prefer if you just did not tell anybody you're a christian you do more damage for the cause of christ by saying oh yeah i'm a christian but yet you're out here doing all this other junk you're just and people are of the world are going i don't want to be anything what he is you know so please do not let anybody know you're a Christian if you're going to behave like this. Please, just keep it to yourself, all right? All right. Nobody wants to hear about your Jesus when you behave like that. You do a lot of damage. Uh, so don't even try to share your faith until you get, get your life where it needs to be, okay? Paul says, <laughs> tells us to stand firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Okay, we're all on a team here. You notice the team spirit of this passage of scripture? Uh, he says, strive side by side. You know, we lock arms. We're, we have the same unifying Holy Spirit within us. So we're going to carry the same message to, to the world out there. And we, we need to uplift and edify each other because we all have this common goal and this common task okay uh, we're like we're striving together on one team uh, basically is what he's saying standing firm in one spirit striving side by side for the faith of the gospel verse 28 and not frightened in anything by your opponents this is a clear sign to them of their destruction but of your salvation and that from God. What's Paul saying here? He says, having no fear is a clear sign to the enemy that they're doomed. They're doomed and you're not, okay? We're on the right side, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, he's saying, Paul wants his readers basically to live courageously for Christ in the midst of opposition and persecution. Will there be conflict in your life if you are a Christian? Guaranteed, lots of it, lots of conflict. How many of you are comfortable with 
comfortable with conflict. Man, that's about right. So what do we need in order to be able to be that person, to be like the Apostle Paul? We need to be equipped. We need to be equipped because nobody likes conflict. Well, some people do. Some people like conflict, but most people don't. And so if you're going to be in the battle, there's going to be conflict. Okay, so you need an equipping. So God is, has done the equipping. When you were born again, God is equipping you. Okay, as you grow, he keeps equipping you. So and now, now that you know that you are equipped for this, it's just a matter of choosing to do it choosing to get into the battle, right? Are you to be afraid? What does verse 28 say? It says, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Fear is of what? The enemy. Fear, the enemy uses fear to discourage Christians. Did you know that? Yeah, the enemy will say, oh, you don't know enough Bible to be talking to anybody about Christ or they're just going to slam the door in your face or whatever it is that you're thinking. Well, let me tell you something. Those thoughts of sharing your faith, that's not an accident. God's placing those things there. Those fearful things that come into your mind, that's coming from a different place and that's the enemy. Okay? So think about that. Think about that. There's going to be conflict. Paul says, don't be afraid. Because every time that there's a clear victory over the enemy, it's a sign to the enemy of their own imminent destruction. Have y'all read ahead in the Bible and to see who wins? Okay, so you already know. All right, you're on the right side. God wins. Satan's, Satan and the powers of darkness, they all lose. All right, so you don't really have anything to be, a, be afraid of, especially if you don't fear death. Uh, we know that uh, standing for Christ, who gets the ultimate victory? Christ does. Can it be a struggle? Most definitely. But uh, our victory may come in a, in a different way, like Paul's talking about. Our victory may be victory in death. Have you thought about that? Just because you're on the winning team, you don't need to. But uh, your victory may be as a for Christ. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah. Nobody's jumping in line to be a martyr, uh, except for Paul. Uh, most Christians, they're still not there yet. But uh, it's a very possible, a very real possibility. Verse twenty nine and thirty says for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake y'all getting this verse 30 engaged in the same conflict that I had that I still in a conflict okay this is a, a real interesting verse it says for it has been granted you, to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. All right. For it has been granted to you. This is not an accident. Suffering for Christ is not, an, is not accidental and it's not divine punishment. Okay. He's not punishing you because you're suffering for Christ. You have to understand that. Because when I went to the Greek... Uh, it, the word for granted is Eucharisti, Eucharisti, which I'm probably butchering, but it is a word derived from the Greek word. Uh, the Greek word is Eucharisti. It means grace or favor. Don't miss that. Do not miss this. By God granting you the opportunity to suffer for his sake, He's saying you have favor in the Lord's eyes because he selected you for that. That's what this verse is telling you. He picked you and he picked me to do this task that involves great suffering, sometimes death, but he selected you 
because of his favor toward you. That's what the Greek says. He favors you to carry the gospel. He shows favor to you. It's grace. That word is like, I, I had never seen this before uh, looking at Philippians <clears throat> until I looked at the Greek word. But he has, uh, is not causing you to suffer just because he's, he's a mean God and he wants you to suffer. No, he favors you, giving you the opportunity to carry the gospel or to share your faith or whatever. Now, I don't, I don't want to, I want to be very clear about this so that I, I don't uh, uh, confuse anybody. But this struggle, uh, that's an indication of God's favor toward us. Uh, why, why would God do that? Okay, why would he look upon us with favor to carry the gospel and get into the struggle? Why would he do that? Well, I thought about it a lot. And here, here's what it is. Here's the answer. Where do we grow? Where do we grow? Always in the valleys. Always in suffering. Always in tribulation. Always. <clears throat> we never grow on the mountaintops. So when we grow in our faith and in our trust, we're in the valley when we're growing. What happens in the valley most of the time? Suffering. So by... God saying, okay, I'm going to show favor on you, Gerald. I'm going to have you suffer for the name of Christ. Okay? And you're going, well, gee, thanks. But, but it's because he's going to grow you to have faith and trust in him. That's an awesome thing, to grow closer to him. What's his final goal? So that we would be more like Christ. For each of us as believers, for us to grow to be more like Christ. That's what God's trying to do. He's putting us through the refining process here on earth so that we would grow to be more like Christ. So that's why he says, when he calls you to suffer, he says, I'm looking upon you with favor. I'm giving you a grand opportunity to grow closer to me and to trust me and have faith in me so that you can walk in any circumstance and be above it. It doesn't phase you. You can kill me. You can hang me up by the rafters. I used to have a pastor says used to say, he says, you can hang me upside down and cut my throat and I'll just go and be with Jesus. You can't hurt me, you know? You can't hurt a guy like that or a woman like that. And so God is showing favor on us, giving us this opportunity to be that person, okay? We can do it. We can do it. Verse 30, if we, Paul is basically saying if we join in the battle, that we will be engaged in the same conflict that Paul has been in and is now in. And we know what that conflict is. That's a lot of suffering, isn't it? A lot of suffering. His life is hard. Uh, but again, uh, in the final analysis, we get to choose. We get to choose. Are we going to be that person or are we going to be this person? It's our choice. God does not interfere with uh, our human free will. Okay? We get to choose. So I hope everybody in here chooses right. I hope I choose right. You know, it's a big deal. We've only got a short window to live on this earth. And some of us are the windows closing fast. <laughs> it's not talking about me. <laughs> the windows closing. Uh, my wife always tells me, she says, will you stop talking about death? I'm, you're so depressing. <laughs> well, guess what? Nobody's staying here on this earth. Nobody. All right, let's close. Lord God, uh, pray, Lord, that your words would uh, penetrate our spirits. Lord, give us something to ponder that, uh, Lord, would make us better. Christians, help us to grow. Help us to expand and help us to always share with others uh, the hope that lies within us in each and every one of us, which is you, Lord Jesus, crucified. Lord, we just thank you so much. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus, amen.